welcome to this edition of Indian Education Outlook. Our guest here today is Mr. Tarun Vadva. And uh, Tarun is an entrepreneur, a strategist, a lecturer, and writer who is working at the intersection of technological advancement, innovation, global growth, security, and public policy. If that sounds like a mouthful, he's also the founder and CEO of Day One Insights, a strategy and advisory firm which focuses on trends that are overturning established industries. He also works on developments in cybersecurity, privacy, surveillance, and the impact of technological advan as advancements on legal systems and social institutions. As you can see, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> He's also a fellow at Emory University's Department of Political Science. He's a visiting instructor at Carnegie Mellon's University College of Engineering. Thank you so much, Tarun, for joining us. It's, you know, it's, I'm delighted to have you here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, so, you know, we are basically trying to understand today the kind of disruption that has been taking place, uh, particularly in the field of higher education. So let me start with a simple one. Has the pandemic really been a catalyst to the disruptive changes we were seeing in higher education? You know, yes and no, in many ways. Yes, in the sense that since everyone is online, all experiences have to go digital. So, um, and no, in the sense that online education isn't new. It's been around for, you know, at least a decade or two, depending on the school you're looking at. So while aspects of this are certainly new, we're doing what we've been doing for a long time before, for better or worse. Now, what that means is that we've been trying to take different classes and put them online. So sometimes we have remote education, sometimes we'll have hybrid online, offline learning. But now for the first time, we have to take every course we have virtually and put it online and make it in a way so students can engage with that content and curriculum and get a fulfilling experience. Now, that sounds very easy, but as we're seeing, it's not really as simple as taking your lectures and putting them on YouTube. And that's because the college experience, the academic experience, it turns out, is more than just learning. It's more than just classes. It has to do with networking. It has to do with um, discovery. It has to do with um, different types of connection information and that sort of thing. So I feel mm -hmm. like we're in the very early days of this. You know, I look around at um, you know our MOOCs or you know the Zoom-based classes that I'm doing at several universities and Frankly, it leaves a lot to be desired. So, um, you know, this this is real disruption, but I think we still haven't seen the real disruption yet. I think there's a lot more improvements coming down the line. Uh, you know, you said this is not the real disruption. So what are the three sort of major changes that you see coming up very soon? What kind of disruptions can we expect in higher education? Absolutely. So, you know, a few areas where I think, um, I'd like to reframe this a bit differently. Where are areas that are underdeveloped where we need to focus attention in order to improve the student experience? So. One of those I think is peer-to-peer -peer learning. You know, we can learn an enormous amount from our colleagues. They can help us as we go through uh, lectures, that sort of thing, especially in the online world. So if we can facilitate more than just chat rooms, more than just message boards, perhaps figure out how to have students engage with each other at different um, parts of the course, then, then we can advance that portion there. Uh, the second thing where I think we need major improvements is in the tools themselves. I mentioned Zoom. Zoom is a very one-way thing. At Carnegie Mellon, uh, the classes that we teach go four hours long. At Emory, often, they're three hours long. It's a long time for a human being to sit at a, at a computer and stare at a little dot. Uh, it's a very unnatural thing there. So, you know, it, as much as I can with the limited tools available to me, I've been seeing um, how do I make this more than just a one-way discussion. So one way we do that is by calling on students. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Socratic method. I was a former pre-law student myself, so I still have those memories of you know being called on randomly and the anxiety that brings. But I find out I find that if you do this in an online environment and you take the pressure off, you can get some really interesting results. So um, one thing I did this year, which I've never done before, is I had a student some a list of my students with their names randomized, and I went one by one and I asked everyone an opinion question. And these are questions that don't have a right or wrong answer. There's no grade attached. They can't be penalized. So, you know, I asked them, um, once, our, once we have holographic displays available cheaply, what will we use it for? What will we do with that? Now, there's no right answer to that question, but um, what I found is if you ask these sorts of questions, then you can get people to engage in different ways. So that's just one aspect of it. And then we have, you know, breakout rooms and these smaller ways to, to divide people up. But um, uh, they leave a lot to be desired. You know, that's one thing we do in person in our courses. We break people up into small small diverse groups of five or six 
and we get them to work on different prompts together. And by the end of the semester, um, if they're not friends, they at least know how each other think. And that is really, really valuable. And students have told me that's something that they appreciate a lot too. And the third thing I mentioned, you know, stepping away from the live classes for a second to recorded classes, looking at the world of MOOCs, um, the same sort of thing I'm describing about one-way communication, but I think we really need to change the way we break that up. You know, normally they'll take an hour long lecture or two hour long lecture and break it up into five, six minute chapters. Now that's a step in the right direction. That's useful, but I think the real disruption there comes from, from a, a bit of a different orientation. There's um, a university, University of San Diego, that has a certain course and it's built in a different way where it's built in multiple levels and layers. So I get to one section of the course, and depending on my feedback, what I get right or wrong, it takes me down a series of several different hundred paths. And in those paths, there's more specific instruction, there's more specific um, knowledge for my fellow peers, that sort of thing. So instead of looking at one constant path, we're looking at learning as this winding, twisting journey with a lot of uh, different steps, and we can make a lot of different interventions to help people learn at that stage. Oh, okay, you know, th those are you know very, very sort of interesting, interesting disruptions. But how long do you think that's going to take to really sort of you know come into sort of play? And that that's that's like the, the million dollar question here, right? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I suspect that we'll see this happen in different stages at different places. So, um, you know, you're already seeing the universities in, in the United States, I'm sure soon to be abroad, say the fall semester, the one coming up at the end of the year is going to be remotely done, fully online, or as much as possible. Sometimes there's students that need to be in dorms for various reasons, that sort of thing. So I suspect you'll see this happen in different places at different times. But the, the, the sort of the macro factor here that we have to consider is the coronavirus. It's forcing us all to adapt at the same time. And now mm -hmm. if this virus is winding down this month, then perhaps we'll go back to our old ways. If we're in for another six months, nine months or more of this, then I suspect you'll see not all universities, but a majority of universities really have to embrace remote learning. Now, I suspect even when this virus passes, what we're going to find is that for certain types of learning, not for all types of learning, this is more convenient. This is more cost effective. Perhaps it fits better with working people in their schedules, that sort of thing. So um, I don't think we'll ever go back to normal as we used to know it, but uh, there's a lot of things we're going to learn in this process. Whether all these changes will stay or not is a different story. You know, it's interesting that you said that because, you know, we keep talking about tech being the major disruptor in higher education and how the Internet will make education sort of more egalitarian. But where does that sort of uh, leave the campus, as it were? I mean, that's a major question. We really need to rethink and reinvent the role of the campus in the in the way. So, you know, what this has revealed to me, this whole experience of the last few months is that the campus is incredibly vital. Um, you look at students right now and generally speaking, I don't mean to speak for anyone individually, but there's a lot of unhappiness, especially when you go to where students that came from other countries or other parts of the world, or excuse me, um, other parts of the country, or other parts of the world where they're paying San Francisco or Bay Area living costs and rents. And they're having to be in a tiny dorm, you know, taking online courses. That is not a great experience. So the campus is a major role there. What they're missing is the campus part of the experience, you know, and what this tells us. And I think the technology industry has gotten this wrong a bit. You know, they've reduced the academic experience down to just the content. It is far more than the content. So when it comes to the campus, you know, first of all, there's a lot of physical security measures that we need to figure out in terms of social distancing, in terms of masks, in terms of uh, public restrooms, that sort of thing. There's some major logistical questions to work out. So that's phase one. Phase two is what is the role of the campus in the future of the university? And I would argue it's a very important role. It's there for face-to-face -face facilitation, for networking, for um, different types of events, for listening to speakers, this sort of thing. Um, all of the aspects that we, we got from this that weren't just the content reside in the campus. So it's a great advantage um, if it's used correctly. Now, I suspect other professions, other universities, perhaps community colleges or trade schools may have learned that that role is so small or so contained, they don't need to actively maintain a campus. Perhaps they just need to borrow a campus or they need to rent facilities or they need to um, you know, facilitate gatherings at a certain place, that sort of thing. So um, either the, the campus needs to be rethought, needs to be reimagined, and we need to see is it worth the cost? Are we getting as much as we can out of this? And how can we use the campus to really maximize the student experience? Right. 
you know, uh, I remember Forbes, I think, uh, did a story which said that instead of going to college to get a job, students will increasingly be going to a job to get a, uh, get a college degree. Is that how you see things changing in some way? You know, I see where they're coming from in the sense that perhaps the education that we get in the workplace is more relevant and useful and more um, helpful to guide us toward a career. But I, I don't, I wouldn't take it nearly as far as they are, mainly because I don't really believe that you can go to a large company anymore and enroll in a career that will last you for decades um, and the education will help support that career. It's not the world we live in today. Um, the world we live in today and the half life of a career is five years. So, you know, you go work at a large company and perhaps the large company itself is getting disrupted or going out of business or that sort of thing. So I, I wouldn't put my, my uh, eggs in that basket per right. se. I wouldn't rely on an employer to help me figure out my education path. You know, we keep talking about, you know, how disruption will impact students. Yeah. How does it impact teachers? I mean, you mentioned something earlier, but you know, do you think teachers will also need to reorient themselves and sort of to get in, into this new kind of new normal as it were? Absolutely. And I can tell you that's been perhaps one of the largest struggles with this semester. The students did fine. Uh, you know, they're used to the dealing with online interactions, watching videos. This, this isn't that new for them. Um, for teachers, it's a different story. Um, there was a lot of technical difficulty getting used to Zoom, getting used to that form of interaction, even doing something as simple as staring at a camera when I can't look at you in the eye online. It's a very, very strange behavior. You know, we're not used to this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you add, you know, generational aspects to it. You add age, you add familiarity, you add just the time that certain people spend in front of screens versus others, and you have a big gulf there. So um, I would argue it's been significantly harder for teachers to adapt than students. So that's just online instruction. And then the content itself has to be very different. You know, in, in the lectures that I teach at Carnegie Mellon, um, we put a big focus on imagery, on video, on that sort of thing, because we see that as a very valuable supplement to our learning. It turns out that translates really well online, bandwidth issues aside. So that visual style of teaching turned out to be really good for online instruction, but um, you need to do things a bit differently. Perhaps you need to speak differently. Perhaps you need to orient the content differently. Perhaps you need to stop and make it um, engaging or make sure people are awake, that sort of thing. And then there's, there's other discussions that come up, such as a, a question I've heard a lot of professors discuss is whether to require uh, students to stare at cameras while they take a class. Some people right. say that this is how you uh, assure attendance and participation. I personally find that idea very unsettling in a way. I've been on the other side of this exchange and I don't want to have to stare at a screen for four hours with either someone or a piece of software tracking whether I'm paying attention. That's a very um, unhuman way to, uh, to approach the situation. So I don't enforce that in my class. In fact, I tell students, turn your cameras off. Just be there when I call on you. I just want to make sure you're comfortable, you're paying attention. I'm not here to, you know, look inside your room or violate your privacy or make sure your eyes are focused on some camera. That is not the way we teach. So um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that still need to be figured out and perhaps the greatest people that need to adapt, the greatest uh, change that needs to happen comes from the instructors themselves. So what you're saying is now teachers need to have a course for it. I mean, re-educate themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Disruption goes both ways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, coming back to empl employment, given yeah. that employers are sort of increasingly looking for contextual knowledge rather than sort of a formal educational qualification, I think uh, Facebook and Google right now, they have a policy that they don't even ask you for your degrees. They just want to know whether you know the subject. Yeah. So, you know, do you think a college degree is sort of becoming increasingly relevant? For the vast majority of people, it absolutely still is. Despite the, the propaganda of the tech industry and people like Peter Thiel and, you know, these sorts of people in power, for a small group of young people with very good hard tech skills, you perhaps don't need to go to college. You can work outside of the formal education system and do very well, especially in, a, in an industry like tech. Now, for that small group of people, you don't need to go to college. For everyone else, you're likely not to ever get a call back from most of these companies without a college degree. And that's just the truth of the matter today, whether these companies like to admit it or not. So, you know, for specific skills, perhaps there will be more and more pathways whereby a person can go uh, from high school or with some amount of knowledge and education and do very well and make, make money or achieve success in whatever way that's defined in their career. 
for the vast majority of the rest of us, we still need that credentialing. We still need that signaling. If you can't find a way to stand out in your field to that degree, you need you need a, a, an outside a, um, institution of some kind certifying that you know these skills that you're at least in theory employable and that they've certified you that you know them to a certain degree. It still provides a very valuable service. Now, does that necessarily have to be a two or four year degree? Perhaps not. Perhaps in the future I can show you my 50 certificates and as an employer that's more than enough to say this person's qualified for the job. So it's not necessary that it has to be the four year degree that we have today. You know, I can see that, you know, being broken apart into more useful, interesting ways. But I do believe there is this need for a third party of some kind to signal and, 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 uh, and certify what we know to others. Yeah, I mean, it, you can't be a doctor just because you've taken a YouTube course. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's, it's, or, or an engineer. You need to have some kind of a formal, you know, course that goes to. And I'm sure it's quite a punishing course to begin with. Not everybody can become an engineer or a doctor. But, you know, for the humanities, it might make sense to sort of see that, you know, you don't really need to have a, I mean, unless you are planning to get into academics, in which case you will certainly need to have a higher degree. You know, um, I think you're right there, that, that if you look at the humanities, some of the barriers that have been built up, some of the, the obstacles are artificial and perhaps not beneficial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but given this pandemic, what happens to students, particularly foreign students who are eager to, you know, for the US campus experience? You yeah. mentioned that already. Yeah. But I'm trying to understand that many of them have taken huge loans and now they're being told that, you know, we're giving you the thing online. You don't have to come to the college. So um, what, what, what happens to them? And, and, you know, there is also a sort of a thought which says that the next big sort of a default is going to be student loans, particularly in the US. People who have taken huge loans and now, you know, if the colleges are shut or if you can't pay your fees, it's going to be an issue. What, what do you think of that? I, it's, it's absolutely a real issue. So starting with the, the student loan aspect first, you know, it's, it's a real problem, and especially when you break it down by certain fields, because this pandemic is really hitting certain fields harder than others. So depending on what you got your degree in and when you got it and where you got it from, um, yes, I, I can see some major issues coming up with people being able to pay their student loans. People can't even pay their rent right now in many parts of the country because uh, their, their economy has disappeared, their job has disappeared, their livelihood. That's a serious issue. Right. Now, moving on to your point about foreign students, this is also an incredibly serious issue. And I, you know, I really feel for, for the situation that they're in. I, you know, at, at Carnegie Mellon, at least half my class the last four years has been foreign. At Emory, the proportions are, are similar depending on the room you're in, that sort of thing. And I, I genuinely think it's a very good thing. I love the perspective that it brings. I love being able to have a discussion and hear from, you know, 14 different countries about how they view that sort of thing in different parts of the world. I, I think it's incredibly enriching. But at some point, for the students themselves, they have to ask, am I getting my money's worth out of this exchange? And here I have major concerns. You know, in a normal environment, with the US campus experience, as you described, you know, you build a network, you get to see the country, you get to engage in different experiences. You have that spontaneity that really makes it fun and interesting. Without that, you know, what are you really paying for in that sense? You're paying for the credential, you're paying for the signaling. That's absolutely valuable, especially as you talk about the top tier universities. But in that middle tier and that lower tier, um, the deal starts to get worse and worse. And so um, I, I my, you know, my heart goes out to them in the situation that they're in. Um, I, I would just advise them to think at the end of the day, are you really getting your money's worth here? Perhaps mm -hmm. if you wait a year or two, if that's something that's feasible, perhaps you should, you know, come get a head start while the economy is decimated, you know, make some advancements on your education so that two, three, four years from now, when things are better, then you're, you're in a much better position. So. It's a highly individual decision, and I don't mean to tell anyone what they should do here, but I certainly sympathize with the idea that um, sitting in a dorm in a foreign country is not the same as the on-campus experience, and perhaps that shouldn't cost the same either. But, you know, let's look at it from the college point of view. I think a lot of their funding actually comes from students who come in from abroad and, you know, pay large sums to sort of, you know, run. What happens to colleges that are heavily dependent on foreign students? They're, they're in a tough situation here now, you know, it's not just the pandemic here, we have a greater economic decoupling from China and so much of US universities have been dependent on revenue from China in the form of students or in the form of groups that come and take programs, that sort of thing. It's a huge economic issue for these schools and now they're gonna have a massive hole in their budget. So 
if this virus disappears, their problems don't go away. Um, they're going to have to figure out how to readjust their systems for less foreign students. Now, let's say um, travel is impacted and we have two years of people not wanting to get on planes, a year, whatever it is. <laughs> That's also going to really impact the university system. So they have to adapt. They have no other choice here. Now, perhaps they may need to scale back a little. Perhaps um, they need to draw from other sources of funding. You know, universities like Harvard, I'm sure, have no problem drawing upon their private funding network. For, for the smaller tiers, other universities, it's going to be difficult. So they're going to have to figure out how to solve that because um, they no longer have time to, to do it. It, it. The geopolitical realities and the macro factors have now caught up to them to the point where they're going to have to adapt and there's really no other choice. And keep in mind, this impacts some universities more than others. Um, our, our smaller community colleges and trade schools and, and state schools and things like that aren't nearly as reliant on uh, foreign dollars. Right, right. But, you know, and neither are the Ivy League colleges because I suppose they have enough funds to, you know, they have a corpus on which they depend on. It's, I suppose, the ones in between which sort of, you know, uh, basically run on student funding in many ways. You'd be surprised how some of the upper tier schools and, and where, their, um, you know, their, their sources of foreign funding and foreign students come from. But point taken, absolutely. But, you know, uh, slightly off the subject here, while talking to you and you were trying to explain that, you know, how the teaching itself changes. Yeah. And I was suddenly reminded of Australia, where, you know, people used to have a school education way in the outback through radio and stuff like that. And exams, you somebody, you, you know, they used to send exam papers by helicopter and stuff like that to, for people right. to right. fill up and sign. Right. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if you go back to the, I mean, now I guess they don't have it that way. Everybody's got internet connection and stuff like that. Sure. But in the olden days, they used to basically sure. do education over the telephone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Australia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And where people would sort of, you know, plug into some line and then listen to what the teacher would say because you, they couldn't attend classes because they were way out in the outback. Sure. Absolutely. Now the internet having come in, I'm sure that's changed a lot. But, you know, when you were explaining how you try to reach individual students, I was just reminded of that in, in, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very interesting in that way. I hope we don't regress to the point where we need to rely on helicopters and radio and telephones and that sort of thing. Uh, but I hope we take that same mindset, really, and apply it to the problem that we have today. And there's something very interesting going on, which is that um, the, the whole world is moving over to smartphones from dumb phones. India is a bit ahead of the curve in this aspect. China is way ahead of the curve. But, you know, when people move, when they have a dumb phone, they can text and they can uh, call. And that's a very, very useful thing. When they have a smartphone, they can do anything that software allows, which is virtually anything. It's almost an unlimited amount of applications. And that's the value yep. of it. So, you know, if we consider that the new radio, the new telephone in that sense, I don't consider a smartphone a telephone, I guess. Um, yes. Then perhaps let's take that same mindset and think, how do we design for intermittent internet connections, intermittent electricity, areas where perhaps multiple languages are spoken or, you know, um, we need to break things up in different ways. Uh, this sort of thing, or perhaps there's several people that share one device, one account. So can we take that same sort of thinking, that same sort of creativity and ingenuity and apply it to modern technologies to get the best of both worlds. That's what I would hope for. And that's why I think, you know, what's happening in India with education is so interesting for the rest of the world. Um, you know, most of America has never even heard of all the advances happening in India and in China and many of these places around these sorts of things here. If they work in markets like India, they're applicable all sorts, all, in all sorts of places. Yeah, but you know, in India, we have a problem that there's a certain, you know, even let's say in a rural area where there's some people do have smartphones, but when they want to take a class, they're sitting in a room with everybody else around all trying to understand what's going on. And, you know, that, that sort of uh, disrupts the learner's experience, as it were. If you have a mother and father trying to peer over your shoulder to see what, what you're up to and things like that. So we do have that kind of a challenge. Yes. And we, I think, even if people have smartphones in the rural areas, they have sort of built up a rather powerful network of, you know, uh, digital connectivity across the country. Um, bandwidth becomes an issue. Particularly with the lockdown, I mean, with everybody getting onto Netflix or using Zoom or doing their work from home, our bandwidth just keeps collapsing every now and then. And that can cause a lot of trouble. Absolutely. And, you know, to hear your point about having so many students in a class together, that's one of the other things that we need to figure out about this whole future of learning thing, which is how do we adapt to different learning styles? We all learn in different ways. Um, some people, that, that class is heaven for them, being around a bunch of noisy other students. 
working through problems together. For other people, probably people like me who, you know, I'm, I'm more introverted in that sense. I would rather read the book alone, silently digest the information, and then go discuss it with others, that sort of thing. So that noisy classroom is a, is a horrible situation for me. So, you know, that's one thing that we need to figure out. Of course, you're, you're absolutely right. The quarantine complicates things. It, it shortens our options. It really collapses our, our ability to do things in different ways. But once that passes, or at least is contained to a certain extent, uh, then we need to figure out how do we adapt the future of learning for different styles and allow everyone to be on the same page. One of these major trends that you're seeing, especially here in Silicon Valley, is this idea of personalized learning in, in the elementary space and with younger children. And I would argue that so far this has been mostly a disaster in the sense that what they do is they, they, they take a bunch of smart children, they give them iPads, then they give them these instructions and these applications that have words they don't understand, uh, no context, very little flexibility. And they tell the students to work on it alone for three hours and then they come together and discuss it in these ad hoc groups. And uh, they, they sold this to us as a future of learning. And for me, I've been very skeptical of this sorts of things. And we've seen companies like Alt School, Summit Learning, big names in Silicon Valley, really go out of business in the last year or at least um, significantly reduce their business presence and rethink their approach. Because I believe personalization is way more than just me and a screen. It's me and a learning style and a whole environment that adapts to that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we look at, you know, I keep on coming back to employment because most people take up education not for the sake of education, but because they hope to get a better job or to improve their lot in life. Absolutely. So now with all this disruption going on, what kind of new employment opportunities do you see for students who are, you know, who, which were not there maybe 10 years ago or five years ago, but because of advances in technology and things like that. Are there any specific areas which you feel that students might want to consider which are not so well known? So generally speaking, you know, pandemic aside, and the pandemic does play into this, I think this is the most interesting time perhaps ever for students, young people, in terms of the abilities and things that they're able to do. Small groups of people can accomplish things that only big labs, big companies, and big governments can do in the past. So. I think by far the most interesting career path available to any student period is entrepreneurship. You can literally go create a company in any industry with cheap technologies right now that, that is massively disruptive, creates huge social impact, and really improves the quality of people's lives. So that opportunity mm -hmm. is second to none and is the most interesting by far to me. You know, So if I were advising my students, what do you do in this horrible economy? What do you do when you're graduating with very little prospects? Go create your own job, go create your own opportunity, go create your own company. Because this is the time, these horrible economic periods, where the best ideas are made and where the best companies are made and that sort of thing. That aside, which I think is by far the top opportunity, period, we're starting to see really interesting things happen. Um, you know, in terms of people being able to network together, people being able to connect together outside of geography based on interest. So that will in itself create new jobs. I'm sure there's a lot of new remote learning jobs available, you know, now that we're on the subject. Um, different types of community management, different types of um, groups of people that can be brought together because of these remote learning tools. And then what can they do? So, um, you know, I suspect, you know, another way we can look at this sort of question is, will this change the orientation of how business works and will that lead to new career opportunities? So um, one discussion that we're having a lot here in Silicon Valley is, do we need all the startups physically here to move here, to rent office space, to rent here? Because it's really expensive. And that's a really big right. prohibition to entrepreneurship and the cost of business. So can we have a remote model where perhaps we um, all rent a conference room in San Francisco for a week, but then we live in Austin, Denver, New Delhi, you know, wherever the hell we want to live. And we work together as a team across different time zones with these remote collaboration tools. Now, certain industries like, you know, um, journalism or you know uh, things that are very online very uh, idea based that don't have a lot of physical touch that don't require hardware or manufacturing equipment or that sort of thing you'll see those starts of teams become distributed and so it will create new job opportunities in different places now will that mean that the amount of jobs overall gets bigger perhaps not but it will get dispersed in lots of interesting ways so i think if you're in um, other parts of the country outside of the big cities here you may start to see more tech opportunities and more more sorts of things like that that weren't previously available. Uh -huh. You know, in India, there's a proposal that has come. It's a sort of a draft new education policy, which has been again tweaked for this pandemic, where they're saying that apart from, you know, subjects which actually need a lab, a physical lab, 
everything else you can do online. So, you know, engineering or, 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 or medicine or, or subjects like that, you actually need to have a lab where you can go and sort of practice on you know, a few things. So do you think that's a good idea where you're just sort of, you know, totally delinking anything that doesn't have a lab thing, but everything else you're doing online? Is that what we are looking at now? Or do you think that that's a good thing? I see what they're getting, and perhaps there's a kernel of truth there that certain fields and disciplines require a lot more touch, require a lot more physical presence and, and things like that. So if it's a way to sort of bolster and organize classes, I, I get what they're saying there, but I, I'm not sure I agree with the general point there that certain types of learning don't require in-person facilitation or those sorts of physical spaces and presence. Um, again, I, I would argue that's the same fallacy Silicon Valley makes of reducing the academic experience to just content. Um, so, you know, I agree in part there, but I'm not sure I agree with the, the larger truth they're getting at, which is that certain disciplines don't require physical presence. Mm -hmm. you know, the last question, I mean, you know, I was talking about a lot of Indian students who have sort of applied for US jobs and now they don't know what to do. Sure. Many of them are also worried that even if the pandemic ends officially, which I don't think it will happen soon, they're worried that immigration policies have already changed with Trump and a few others, so they might not be eventually even allowed to get into the U.S. Do you think that they should still keep aspiring for, for a U.S. degree or do you think they should sort of look around and, you know, see if they can get something locally or look somewhere else? What, 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 what would be your advice to that? This is such an individual decision, you know, I, I, I feel like I can't even almost tell people what to do here, but I see this every year. It breaks my heart every year, my students, they're most, you know, some of the most brilliant uh, people of their age in the world, uh, they're, they're, you know, trained by me in that sense, they, they went through my class, so they have this amazing perspective, they're ready to group, do great things, and then they have to deal with our immigration system, and it's it's a horror show in a lot of ways. Um, they, they often have to deal with uh, bad paperwork, they have to deal with these cumbersome processes, they can only work at certain companies, it limits their entrepreneurial opportunities, and then the cultural aspects of it, and this is, um, it's not new, there's always been anti-immigrant sentiment to a degree in the US, but it has objectively gotten worse in the last three years for some reason. Um, but, um, you know, so so we have a, a not great situation with immigration in the US and I, I, I really, it really, you know, breaks my heart to tell my students and to see them have to leave and go back and not be able to pursue the opportunities they want here. You know, at the end of the day, I'm born and raised in the United States, I want what's good for America and what's good for America is for these students to stay and to contribute to our economy and to fulfill their dreams and then give back to the world in the ways they see fit. But our immigration system just doesn't allow for that. Our politics don't allow for that. As they stand, things can change. So um, it's an incredibly disheartening situation. Now, for students from India and China in particular, I tell them that, you know, your tech industries are booming. You know, maybe it doesn't seem that way. Maybe the numbers don't exactly spell that out. But if you look at the opportunity and the digitalization that your countries are about to undergo in the next decade, you have massive opportunities, perhaps far bigger than you have in the U.S. So, you know, I, I would prefer they all stay in the U.S. I want them all to live in California and be my neighbors and work in my community because they're they're that great. Uh, but realistically speaking, you know, if they have great opportunities at home and that's something they're interested in, they may be better off pursuing that. But if they would like to come to the U.S., I would never discourage anyone from, you know, pursuing their dreams in that in that sense. There's you know, this this country could really use their help. Um, and politically speaking, you know, it really depends on what happens in November here. Um, and and the, the, the two parties look at these issues a bit differently. You know, perhaps even if we have Trump in, you know, he wins another term, I can see a situation where high skill immigrants in areas like engineering perhaps are given visas are allowed to stay where low skill immigrants are more discriminated against. Versus the Democrats and, and Biden, if he wins, they tend to see immigration as a clustered issue of low and high school together. So unless there's some sort of bigger reform, there may not be progress. So um, this issue, even politically, isn't nearly as clean as it seems, and there's a lot of unknowns ahead. Wow. You know, on, the, on, on that note, I think we'll have to sort of close this because we're sort of running out of time. Uh, thank you so very much, Tarun. I really look forward to having you with us again. You know, uh, forget everybody else. My eyes open just listening to you. I mean, it's, it's, you've been really, really sort of, you know, uh, brilliant in the way you explain things. Thank you so very much. Um, that was Mr. Tarun Bhadwa talking about disruption in education. And uh, I really hope to see you back again. Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.